You found it. Your home for the best content on your favorite team, the Fighting Tigers of LSU. Do us a favor, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments below, and be sure to smash that like button. There's a really good piece up at ESPN.com about luxury players in college football. And when they highlight the number two uh, receiver in college football, meaning uh, a college football team's number two receiver, they highlight Brian Thomas Jr. of LSU. By they, I mean uh, the piece's author, who is uh, Adam Rittenberg. He's on Twitter at ESPN Rittenberg and good enough to join us for a couple of minutes here. Adam, we appreciate it, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Um, I would have defaulted to that three-headed monster at Washington. What about Brian Thomas uh, stood out? Well, I, I, interestingly enough, I have Jalen Polk as my number three receiver for this list, um, who's who's really been almost the number two for Washington right. because of injury. But I think with what with, with Brian Thomas uh, Jr.'s done, um, you know, to compliment Malik Neighbors, you know, from the start of the season, touchdown catches, great plays one on one. I mean, he, he he's been outstanding. And so, yeah, before the year, you thought this would be a Mecca Buka at Ohio State or Dalen McMillan at Washington or or someone else. But I, I think that uh, Thomas has really distinguished himself. And you know, a guy that played a, a little bit his first couple of years, but really came into his own this year as a very strong compliment. The guy who I think is, if he wasn't already, is very much on the radar for NFL teams. You know, Adam, we're we're here uh, you know, in Baton Rouge, so we're like in the middle of it. We see it every day. So it's interesting when people who aren't in our bubble can identify and see things that seem kind of obvious to us, but maybe aren't outside. When did you start to become aware of the type of season Brian Thomas was having? I mean, especially on a two-loss LSU team that, that isn't really on the national radar. That's that's fair. I mean, they're a team that you watch from the start because they had the biggest game of week one uh, against Florida State. So you know, and then that offense that I had, had sensed was going to be really good, probably not as good as they've turned out to be yeah. uh, through the first half of the year. But but they were a dynamic offense from the start. He had a big game against Florida State. Um, I, I think the Ole Miss game we were all glued to uh, you know, around the country as far as those two offenses going at each other, and he has three touchdowns against Ole Miss coming off a two-touchdown performance against Arkansas. And so, you know, the, the the touchdowns are what gets your attention maybe outside of Baton Rouge. And then, obviously, you know, even last week with some big plays, obviously the, the, the one really big play against Army. So, um, you know, he, he's, he's a guy that, that now you know, should be on your radar if you've watched Florida State or Ole Miss or Arkansas or any of those other LSU games, and then everyone will, will certainly be watching the next time he takes the field against Alabama. Yeah, Adam, I know um, you're a senior writer at ESPN. For a long time, you covered the Big Ten sort of exclusively. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, I, I am interested in your thoughts on Jaden Daniels as well, being able to see the entire landscape of college football because, boy, it's hard to imagine there's a player playing better than Daniels at this point. What do you think about where Daniels might fall in the pecking order of how guys are playing, not how they project to the next level, but how they're playing this season at quarterback? Yeah, I think he's right there at the top. Um, yeah, I think there's there's obviously competition, especially out in the Pac-12 uh, with with Michael Penix Jr. and Bo Nix and, and others. But you know, with Caleb Williams losing a couple of games and then having a really poor performance against Notre Dame, and you know Michael Penix struggling last week against ASU, uh, we'll see how Bo Nix, who's really been sharp, how he performs against a really tough Utah defense on the road on Saturday and then Jaden week after week is getting it done. And I think what's most impressive about him is it's almost, it's almost like we've seen different iterations of him throughout his career. You know, he's a freshman in Arizona state. He was this high efficiency guy who didn't turn the ball over. Uh, then he became more of a, then he struggled a little bit at ASU. Then he was at LSU last year as primarily a running quarterback. And you know, there were questions about, could he fully embrace being a passer? And, and this year he's doing it all. Still has good rushing numbers, but has really elevated his play as a passer, you know, thanks to you know guys like Brian Thomas and Blake Neighbors and others. So he is a complete quarterback. He's playing at an extremely high level, and he's you know he's playing for a team that is still in the spotlight. Now, bigger picture, you know, can he win the Heisman without beating Alabama? Probably not. History has shown, at least recently, that if you're not on a team that's in contention for the college football playoff you're probably not going to win the Heisman. And I still think LSU is in contention, despite the two losses. But we all know they will be out of contention 
if they lose to Alabama. So that's why this next game is everything for him. If if, Al, if, if LSU wins and he performs well, I think he's a top Heisman candidate. If LSU loses, even if he performs well, he's out of the race. Yeah, no, I would agree with that completely. Do, do you have an, an early thought? I'm not asking for a pick or anything like that, but do you have an early thought on LSU-Bama a week from Saturday? Yeah, I'm really interested in this game because, uh, you know, LSU's defense, it was not good early, you know, not long ago, and um, you know, seemingly has played a little bit better lately against weaker competition. But um, I'm fascinated to see how they're going to perform. And then there's people in the SEC that are questioning: can 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 Alabama keep up with this LSU offense? Which you know, one coach in the league told me it was the best offense he's ever seen. I mean, that that is very high praise for what's going on right now with this Jaden Daniels-led LSU offense. And so you know, this will be, uh, I think, the most talented defense that. They they faced all, all, all year. Florida State's got some talent as well, but LSU, as you guys know, should have scored a lot more points in that game, and and no one's really been able to slow them down consistently since that point. So I'm I I think this is going to be a very competitive game, maybe a different type of game than we've seen from LSU in Alabama. They used to really slug it out with with Nick Saban and Les Miles for years, but these are two. Um, at least on LSU side, you have a, a very dynamic offense, and on, L- on Alabama side, and talented defense and an offense that has the potential to make big plays. So I think the key for LSU is going to be that secondary, which is still very vulnerable and not your typical LSU secondary. Can they stop the big play against Jalen Milrow? If they do, I think they're going to win this game. Mm. Adam, uh, those slugfests uh, weren't weren't always fun for the the good guys in purple yeah. and gold. So we're we're actually okay to see a different style of game down in these parts. Um, a couple more for you. Adam Rittenberg is with us from ESPN.com. He's on Twitter at ESPN Rittenberg. Give him a follow. Uh, Adam, I, I'd love a thought on the the Michigan scandal that seems to be brewing right now. Um, is is this something that I mean, big picture? Like, is this something that could cost Jim Harbaugh his job? I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know. I wish I had a better answer because it's just so early in the process. From what we're hearing out of Michigan, I don't think that they are seeing this as nearly as big of a deal as those outside uh, the program. But again, there's an NCAA investigation going on. There already is an NCAA investigation that hasn't been resolved regarding the recruiting violation and some of the charges that Jim Harbaugh uh, faces there, uh, even though they've self-imposed some, some penalties, including the a three-game suspension earlier this year. And so you're connecting Connor Stallions to Jim Harbaugh and how much of this was known and how much of this was orchestrated and how deep does it go. I think everything is, is, is on the table. But, uh, I, again, I have a hard time seeing Michigan, which is still very supportive of Jim Harbaugh, especially at the top. I, I interviewed Santa Ono, who's their president, in late June. He, you, could probably, you can't find another big, a bigger Jim Harbaugh fan on the administrative side than Santa Ono. So if his opinion changes in light of these allegations, maybe um, you know you, you could see you could see a change there. But I still think the likeliest outcome, guys, is the one that Jim Harbaugh has been trying to facilitate for the last couple of years, and that's Jim Harbaugh going back to the NFL. Hmm. If Jim Harbaugh can find an NFL suitor, whether it's right here where I am in Chicago or somewhere else, he is going to go back to the NFL. If not, I believe he will be at Michigan in spite of you know, another controversy. You know, they're, they're very close. I talked with Ward Manuel, their AD, a couple of weeks ago, and they're working on a contract extension. So, yeah, I would assume that's been put on pause, at least for the immediate. But that, that was the intent not long ago at Michigan was to do whatever it takes to keep Jim Harbaugh as their coach. Adam Rittenberg, hey, before you go, uh, next week we'll have our first uh, college football playoff uh, rankings, which I loathe, by the way. I understand why we all have to do it. But I'm, I'm curious, if you had to pick your top four right now, who would they be? Yeah, so we do this um, after every week of games at, at ESPN.com, so I'll, I'll be transparent with you guys as well. And my mind was uh, Michigan 1, uh, uh, Georgia 2, Washington 3, and Ohio State 4. I, I, I put Washington at 3 before they uh, you know, nearly blew that game against Arizona State, so I might flip the last two. But, 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 but I think for right now, that those are, those are my four. And you know, Ohio State, maybe not the strongest at number four, but hey, they've gone on and they beat Notre Dame on the road. They beat Penn State somewhat convincingly at home. And then uh, Washington has looked uh, very, very good other than the Arizona State game. Michigan's been outright dominant, and Georgia's been pretty dominant. They haven't uh, uh, you know, crushed everyone on their schedule, and this week will be interesting against Florida, but they're, they're, they're still the team to beat, I think, nationally until someone actually beats them. Do you think, last thing, I promise, Do you think because you, you piqued my interest when you said this earlier that LSU's still a, a CFP contender, 
if now they, they would need help, obviously, but if LSU wins out, meaning they'd win at Bama and they would beat presumably an undefeated Georgia in the SEC championship game uh, to go 11 and two, do you think 11 and two SEC champion LSU would be in? I think that'd be a really good possibility. Now, it's it's hard to handicap without knowing what happens elsewhere. Uh, is Michigan and Ohio State an undefeated, undefeated matchup? Uh, in the in, you know, and then and obviously one of those teams is losing and, and not going to the Big Ten championship game. What do you do with that team? Uh, I think the Pac-12 is the deepest conference in the country this year. It would be a real shame if their champion was left out of the playoff. You obviously have now just one undefeated team in the SEC. LSU is not getting in over an undefeated team, but they could be getting in over a one loss team. So I think that that's really what it comes down to. Does Oklahoma, uh, you know, have, have, have a loss? It, it, you know, is it a one loss big 12 champion Texas, for example, which beat Alabama on the road. And in this case, LSU will also have beaten Alabama. So that would be a really interesting debate. You put two loss LSU in, or you put one loss Texas in, LSU maybe having played a tougher overall schedule than Texas. So mm. I think there would be a really good argument for the Tigers, uh, but but it wouldn't be cut, as cut and dry, obviously, if you were uh, undefeated or one loss SEC champ. Uh, he is Adam Rittenberg, ESPN Senior College Football Writer on Twitter at ESPN Rittenberg. Adam, uh, always enjoy your work, man. We appreciate a couple minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please leave your comments. I love to interact. And be sure to hit the red subscribe button below.